have to go in summer because otherwise she has no holidays. She's teaching. Yeah, another in summer is too hot. Another month, I think. It yeah, gets it's very hot. hot. Okay, <laughs> my turn. <laughs> second talk of our um, uh, second day in our uh, conference and uh, our next speaker is Nobi Ray Chan uh, from British Columbia and he will talk about simplifying polynomials by Chernow's transformation. Um, okay, so um, <coughs> this is a very uh, sort of elementary talk on a classical topic. So the topic is uh, simplifying polynomials in one variable by Chernhaus transformation. So this is my polynomial. And uh, <coughs> I will start out by showing you some examples of, of how it can be simplified. And, uh, and then I will eventually become more rigorous and explain what I mean by simplifying, what I mean by Chernhaus transformation. Um, so the first step is the classical Chernhaus transformation that everyone knows about. We make the substitution y equals x plus a1 over n and then y <coughs> satisfies the simpler equation with the first coefficient being zero and the new coefficients b1 through bn, uh, b2 through bn are polynomials in the coefficients of the original polynomial. So b1, as I said, is zero. So, <coughs> so Chernhaus wrote a paper on this. this that, that substitution is probably his main contribution to mathematics. Uh, he also studied some uh, cubics in the plane. Uh, that's, I guess that's not so interesting now. But he made a bigger contribution as a chemist. It's not so well known. So he was uh, uh, one of the people who claimed to, to be the European inventors of porcelain. Prior to that, porcelain was imported from Asia. It was was very expensive. <laughs> OK, so back to polynomials. So now we are down to this form. And I want to show you another substitution, another simple substitution. Uh, so that's rescaling. And what this does is it makes the last two coefficients equal to each other. Uh, <coughs> so, um, so this uh, C's are now rational functions in the B's, and the B's are polynomials in the A's. Um, <coughs> so we get, we get a simpler form with only um, n minus two different coefficients. Note that this substitution makes sense only if uh, bn minus one and bn are non-zero. So to avoid this kind of case-by-case -case analysis as we perhaps work with more complicated substitutions, I want to work with the general polynomial. In other words, I want to take my uh, coefficients to be independent variables. And so well, I'll treat my polynomial as a, a polynomial over the rational function field. And for simplicity, I'll take my base field to be the complex numbers. And in particular, one of the advantages of doing that is that f of x becomes irreducible over that field. So because it's irreducible, we can um, form a field extension uh, of, of my original field k. Um, and this will be, so this L will be a field of degree N. So now I'm in a good position to explain what the Chernhaus transformation is. So Chernhaus transformation is simply a choice of another generator for this field extension. Um, and so once I choose this new generator Y, it transforms my polynomial into F of X into the minimal polynomial of Y. So in other words, what I'm trying to do is define this field extension by a polynomial in the simplest possible way. Um, another remark here is that almost any y will be a generator, um, right? Because of, because of the way I set this up. Um, so the, the Galois group of this field 
will be Sn. And so any intermediate extension will correspond to a subgroup of Sn that contains Sn minus 1. And there aren't any such groups other than Sn and, and Sn minus 1. So, so any non-constant element will be, that's not in K, will be a generator. Uh, okay, so the two substitutions we previously considered are special cases of this construction. Uh, so in general, we want to choose the minimum y, so that the minimal polynomial of y is of a particularly simple form. So the meaning of simple has changed over time. Uh, so for many centuries, uh, this problem that I just stated was the, the, the central problem of algebra and uh, the goal was to solve this polynomial, the original polynomial in radicals. So now we know that this is not possible for n bigger than 5, bigger than 4. So another goal is to make certain coefficients vanish. So for example, can we always find uh, Chernhaus transformation so that the first two coefficients vanish, or the, the first and the third vanish. So these are also classical problems. And uh, the answer to A is, is uh, no, if and only if, N is, of, uh, is the sum of two, uh, of two powers of two. And yes, other otherwise. Um, and Can they be identical powers? Well, yes, they can be. Then you then you get a, a, a power of two. That's actually the easiest case. Um, and and B is still an open problem. And I want to I want to return to that uh, later in the talk. So. <coughs> So this is one way of simplifying, make, make some coefficients equal to zero. And another way, another um, possible way of, of measuring how complicated the polynomial is, um, <coughs> is by looking at the number of independent coefficients. So, so let's review the two Chernhaus transformations that I started out with. Uh, so the first one made one of the coefficients zero, and the second one didn't make any of the new co or any of the remaining coefficients zero, but it made two of them equal to each other. Um, so in each case, the number of independent coefficients decreased by one. In Pardon me? In general, what kind un what's the underlying field? So it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's the complex numbers with the coefficients, the a1 through an being independent variables. So that's what I'm looking at. This is the general polynomial. Um, <coughs> So the natural measure of, one natural measure of complexity of a polynomial is the number of algebraically independent coefficients over C. Um, <coughs> so the goal in this formulation is to choose a Chernhaus transformation so that it transforms our general polynomial to one where this transcendence degree, where if I take all the coefficients, and the field that they generate over C should be uh, of the smallest possible transcendence degree. So I will denote this minimal transcendence degree by tau of n. So we've now arrived at the precise mathematical question. What is the minimal value of tau of n? So tau of n is the minimal number of algebraically independent coefficients. So, sorry, what is the value of tau of n? Which that can be achieved by applying a Chernhaus transformation to this general polynomial. So if I take any other polynomial, I can define tau of n, say, irreducible. I can define tau of n in the same way. 
and the answer will always be less than or equal than this tau. So the number that I can attain for the generic polynomial is, is that's the worst case scenario. So this question is a, an algebraic variant of Hilbert's 13th problem. It's not directly related, but so it's a question in the same spirit as Hilbert's 13th problem. And it remains open for every uh, n starting from 8. So what I want to tell you now is the partial results that are known. And in particular, what happens up to n equals 8. So, so precise, precise values are known for n definitely? Up to 7. So, so what I call a classical example is the case where n equals 5. So this, uh, the quintic was studied quite extensively in the, in the 19th century. Um, so one of the results due to uh, or meet is that any uh, quintic polynomial can be transformed by a Chernhaus transformation, or at least the general one, can be transformed to a ch by a Chernhaus transformation to this two-parameter form. Um, so here, the, the first coefficient is zero, the coefficient of t to the fourth. So that part is easy. And then also the coefficient of t squared is zero. So this is actually a special case of the question I asked earlier. And then once, once that is done, then one can still equalize the last two by the same trick that I showed you. Um, so this means in our language that tau of five is at most two, right? It could be, so this uh, theorem of Hermite doesn't, doesn't say that this is optimal. So it could conceivably be one. However, Klein, <laughs> in his book showed that, that tau of 5 is actually greater than or equal to 2. And I'll, sh I'll show you his proof in, uh, in a minute. So combining these two, we see that tau of 5 actually is 2. So here are some more recent results. Uh, so this is uh, my theorem with Joe Bueller. Uh, proved about uh, maybe 18 years ago. So uh, tau of n plus 2 is at least tau of n plus 1. So as we increase n by 2, this, this number has to, ha so, so it's, it's at least the integer part of n over 2. Yes, yes, you, you, that, that is true. Um, <coughs> um, and maybe I'll say a little more about that in a minute. But for the upper bound, the upper bound is sort of disappointing. So it's only n minus 3. And so I showed you how to get down to n minus 2 with those two simple tricks. So there's only one more <laughs> that I can do. And uh, well, it's, it's disappointing. It, it's not clear which one is closer. So let me just go through the remarks. Um, so the first remark is that for n equals 5, we recover Klein's theorem. So Klein's theorem is a special case, because when n equals 5, tau is between the integer part of 5 over 2, which is 2, and 5 minus 3, which is also 2. Um, <coughs> so another observation is that if we want to make lots of coefficients zero, this gives some kind of a bound to that. So we can't make more than half of them zero. Um, and um, the other observation is that I don't know what happens asymptotically, whether the, the true answer is closer to n over 2n minus 3. So the reason why this equation in part, b, the inequality in part b is so weak may be that that's, that's the right answer. So for n up to 6, this, these two inequalities actually 
given the quality. Um, so for seven, um, Alex Duncan proved that the answer is four. So this, so this is the only little bit of evidence that we have between n over two, integer part of n over two and n minus three, that at least in this case, it's n minus three. So and this is particularly interesting historically because polynomials of degree seven were specifically mentioned in uh, the statement of Hilbert's 13th problem. So the, I, I mean, this is, a, Hilbert's 13th problem is probably a good topic for a separate talk. I'll just mention that, that Hilbert stated uh, his problem for continuous functions, and that was, that was settled in the 1950s by uh, Komogorov and Arnold. So Arnold was still an undergraduate then. Um, and, uh, and since then, uh, Arnold, uh, after that, Arnold came to believe that Hilbert didn't really mean it this way, that what he really meant was an algebraic version. Um, and, he st and he stated this algebraic version in print. And this algebraic version is not exactly the same question that I asked, but it is, um, it is in the same spirit. So in particular, in Arnold's version, one is allowed to take roots, which I'm not allowing here. Uh, and so I suspect, so, so in the for the continuous version, the answer is one. And I suspect for that for the algebraic version as sta stated by Arnold and Shimura, the answer is also one. But for this one, it's, it is, I mean, this is a, uh, a, a different, a different type type of answers. There are many more parameters that are needed here. Um, <coughs> okay, so, so now I want to show you proofs, or at least proof outlines for some of these results. Uh, so the starting point for all of them is the following uh, geometric interpretation of Chernhaus transformations. So a Chernhaus transformation, the way I defined it was the substitution, was, uh, was you know, finding a, a different generator for my, my uh, general field extension of degree n is actually the same thing as an SN equivariant rational map from um, the n-dimensional affine space to itself. Uh, so the only thing I require is that SN should act faithfully on the image. In other words, the image should not be contained in the diagonal. So recall that the rational map is, is given by n rational functions um, in n variables in this case. And um, it's only defined on the Zariski dense open subset, uh, which is obtained by removing the zero locus of the denominators. So the image of a rational map is by definition the Zariski closure of the image of the regular map, of, the, of this map on its domain where it's defined. So returning to our two examples, the classical Chernhaus transformation is simply the linear projection from Cn. So if we think of Cn as a, as a representation of Sn, it's the direct sum of two representations, a one-dimensional trivial representation and this n minus one dimensional reducible representation. So my first example is simply corresponds to the projection to this n minus one dimensional representation. And the second example is a little bit more tricky, but it is, it is rescaling res so that um, so, so, so now I'm starting with this n minus one dimensional representation and then I rescale so that um, the image lies on, on the intersection of those two hypersurfaces. So I send each x to, I mean if you remember the, 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 the formula there was a n minus one over a n times x. 
right? So, so it is now lambda x, and then lambda is chosen. <coughs> so I'm just writing, if, if one rewrites a n minus 1 and a n, these are symmetric functions in the axis, then one, one gets this, this projection. So, with <coughs> so using this interpretation, one can prove the following, that my, my uh, number tau of n is simply the minimal value of d such that um, one can find a dominant rational equivariant map from cn to, to x, where, where d is the dimension of x and sn acts faithfully on x. So in fact, I can choose my x to be a closed Sn invariant subvariety of Cn. This doesn't change the minimum. So using these interpretations, one can um, easily see that this tau has to be at least 1. I guess that's, that's easy enough to see that algebraically as well. But it's certainly trivial from this because otherwise this x would be zero-dimensional and Sn can't act faithfully and so it would be a point and Sn can't act faithfully on it. Okay, so now let me use this interpretation to prove Klein's theorem. So Klein's theorem <coughs> says that in this geometric language that I have no, uh, that there, there doesn't exist a dominant Sn equivariant rational map from Cn to a curve. So, so assume the contrary, that there exists such a map. Then X is, uh, there's a dominant map from, from an affine space to X, so X has to, to have genus 1. Since I'm working over the complex numbers, it, it's isomorphic to P1. And now comes Klein's contribution. So in <coughs> Felix Klein classified the finite groups which admit a faithful action on P1. And here is his list. These are groups are cyclic, dihedral, and then there are three others. A4, A5, and S4. And the symmetric group S5 is not on this list. So, so my tau of 5 cannot be 1 because otherwise I would have a, a, a dominant rational map like that to a curve, but I can't even find a target that would fit in there. So let me now prove this um, upper bound of n minus 3 using this interpretation. So, so here, for for x, I take the quotient of p1 to the power n mod pgl2, and there is a natural map that a rational map that takes cn to the product of n copies of the projective space, and then modding out by pgl2. I have, I have my, so such a map is called a, a compression. So I have my compression. Um, so the, this quotient here can be taken to be either the GIT quotient uh, or more simply just the rational quotient since we only care about it uh, up to a birational isomorphism. So Sn permutes the n copies of C or P1, so this whole map is Sn equivariant. And for n at least 5, Sn acts faithfully on x, on the quotient. And therefore tau of n is less than or equal to dimension of n, which is n minus 3. Or to the dimension of x, and that's n minus 3. So the two examples I showed you are really contained in this construction. So if instead of modding out by PGL2, you mod out by um, the, uh, by unipotent 
uh, subgroup of PGL2, then you get the Chernhaus transformation. And if you mod out by the Borel subgroup, then you get my second, you get the, the combination of the, f of the two tricks that I showed you. So this is a little bit stronger, but it only works for n starting from 5. So if there is going to be any improvement on this uh, inequality, then we have to find a suitable caution phi, which depends on n. Well, you probably can't construct x as a quotient anymore. It would have to be, it would have to be some, something else. Um. <coughs> Okay, so now let me prove this inequality. Um, so, <coughs> so suppose we have a compression. So that means that um, I have a variety X with a faithful action of uh, the symmetric group Sn, and I have a dominant map phi from, from um, the n-dimensional space to X. So our goal is to show that the dimension of x is at least the integer part of n over 2. So, uh, <coughs> so first I want to assume that x is smooth and complete. I can do this by resolving its singular, well first, com first finding some completion and then resolving its singularities. <coughs> It can be done equivariantly, yes. Um, <coughs> so the key lemma is that uh, the existence of phi implies that x has an A fixed point for any abelian subgroup A of Sn. Um, so if, so note that, that Cn has a fixed point for Sn itself, <coughs> namely the origin. So if my map phi were defined at the origin, then I would simply take this fixed point x to be the image of the origin. But it is not. <laughs> Most likely it's not. We're not assuming that it is. So, um, <coughs> so what this key lemma says is that even though it may not be defined there, we can still somehow transport this fixed point to x, but only at the expense of replacing Sn by an abelian subgroup. This is actually quite, quite easy to prove. Um, <coughs> so to prove this inequality above, we take A to be the subgroup generated by the two cycles, the commuting two cycles, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So this group is just uh, the cyclic group of order two to the power integer part of n over two. So since Sn and therefore A acts faithfully on x, A has to act faithfully on the tangent space as well. So this is, this is a, a form of Nakayama's lemma. If some element of A doesn't, fixes a point and fixes every tangent vector at that point, then, then it, it, it has to act trivially on all of X. Um, so that's the reason I wanted to resolve the singularities of X, because I wanted that point to be smooth. And therefore, uh, this group A has to have a faithful representation on the tangent space. And this is only possible if the dimension of the tangent space is at least the integer part of n over 2. And therefore, the dimension of x has to be at least the integer part of n over 2. So this, there, there are many proofs of this inequality now. This is not the, the easiest proof because it I think conceptually it's probably the easiest, but it, it does rely on resolution of singularities. Some of the others don't. 
Okay, so now let me uh, make a few remarks about uh, Duncan's proof uh, in the case where n equals 7. So, um, <coughs> so he actually proved that tau of 7 equals 4. But the difficult direction is, um, I mean, we know that tau of 7 is, at, at, at <coughs> is less than or equal to 7 minus 3, which is 4. So the difficult direction is the other inequality. Tau of 7 is greater than or equal to 4. In other words, if we have a compression from C7 to X, then X cannot be a threefold. One can show that the dimension of X is a is uh, cannot be two. That's the same argument that I showed you before, right? The integer part of um, <coughs> so it's greater than or equal to three. The integer part of seven over two. But so what Alex showed is that it cannot be three. So that's that's the case I will focus on. So his proof is is a more sophisticated, much more sophisticated version of Klein's proof. Um, it relies on Mori's theory. So, so Klein um, looked at the curves, um, you know, which groups can act on, on a one-dimensional X which is dominated by, so, so unirational, dominated by an affine space. Um, but one can ask, ask the same thing, you know, which, which groups can act on the unirational variety in dimension 2, 3, 4, and so on. And it gets exponentially harder. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in dimension 3, this, these are uh, recent results of Prokhorov. He only so, so as I said, that's, uh, these results are a partial three-dimensional analog of Klein's classification. So the, the two-dimensional case was stated by Enriquez and was subsequently refined and rigorously proved by Manin and Niskovsky. So, um, <coughs> so the Enriquez, Manin, Niskovsky classification, it doesn't explicitly give a list of groups. One has to go through it and um, <coughs> so it's, it's already not for any given group to say whether or not it can act on a rational surface is already non-trivial. For three folds this is in full generality this is completely out of the question. So Prokhorov only worked with simple groups. So fortunately A7 is a simple group that's, that's relevant here. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> there are actually three folds um, where, um, so that, well, he, he worked with rationally connected three folds, which is a broader class that includes unirational. And unfortunately, so I mean, it's, it complicates the situation that S7 may actually act on some of these three folds. Um, However, uh, Duncan used this other trick was the fixed points. So Prokhorov gave a list and, and he, sh he, he checked for each one to show that some fixed points are missing. For some, so in some cases, these are, uh, I mean, he varied subgroups, abelian subgroups of SN depending on the, on the threefold. And he showed that, that none of the threefolds satisfy that condition on fixed points. So that's, that's the idea. Um, <coughs> okay, so let me now uh, define the notion of essential dimension, which is, which is essentially in the case where the group is the symmetric group Sn, the essential dimension of Sn is what I defined as tau of n. So we define this number in two di equivalent. So now I want to do it for uh, other groups, G. So we define this number in two equivalent ways. One by counting the independent number of 
the minimal in number of independent parameters required to define the field extension of degree n, and the other one by looking at, at compressions geometrically. And those two, those two ways are equivalent. So the symmetric group plays a key role in both definitions. And geometric definition, in the geometric definition, this role is explicit because this compression is required to be SN equivariant. In the algebraic definition, it's implicit because SN is behind the scenes as the Galois group of, the, of, of every extension that we consider. Uh, so I made sure that that's the case by taking my polynomial to be the, gener the, the generic polynomial. So the geometric definition readily general generalizes to arbitrary algebraic groups. So, so one has to start with a linear representation and look at compressions. So the only change here is that for an algebraic group, the action that should be generically free rather than just faithful. Um, <coughs> and then for many algebraic groups, this number also has an algebraic interpretation that's similar to the number of, the minimal number of uh, algebraically independent coefficients. Um, so it's the, it's the minimal number of parameters required to define certain algebraic objects. In the case of SN, these algebraic objects are field extensions of degree N. And for other groups, uh, for example, for, for the group ON, these are non-degenerate quadratic forms. For PGLN, these are central simple algebras. For G2, they are Actonian algebras. And one can, one can give very similar definitions to the ones I gave. Um, so in each case, there's a unique split object of each type. Uh, defined over the base field C, and G is the automorphism group of this object. So, so, so in the case of ON, this object is the split quadratic form. In the case of PGLN, this object is the split, I mean, the matrix algebra. And uh, in general, these objects are elements of the first Galois cohomology set. So in each case, the essential dimension is the number of independent parameters required to define the most complicated object of the appropriate type. Um, and uh, <coughs> there, is, there is now a large body of literature, including several surveys on this topic. So instead of going into this further, let me just uh, go back to the questions that I asked about uh, finding Chernhaus transformations that actually make certain coefficients zero. So stay back with the sort of the classical um, questions. Okay. So here is the question that I want to address. <coughs> Can we find the Chernhaus transformation that takes the general polynomial to one of this form where the coefficients, the first and the third coefficient are zero. So, <coughs> so by new using Newton's formulas, we can rephrase this question as follows. Can we find an element in the general field extension of degree n, or equivalently in every field extension of degree n that contains the complex numbers? where the smaller field contains the complex numbers. Can we find a generator such that the trace of that generator and the trace of its cube are both zero? Here the trace is the, is the usual trace in a finite field extension. So it's the trace of the linear transformation from L to L viewed as a k vector space given by multiplication by y. OK, so, so I've already showed <coughs> you the answer. Well, previously I showed you the Stearman connection with the counting the number of independent parameters. But it actually gives the answer to this question. 
right? So that's Hermite's theorem in the case where n equals 5. So for n equals 6, there is a similar theorem by Joubert. Um, and I know fairly little about Joubert. There's no picture. Um, oops. As far as I know, this is his only mathematical paper. Um, so it's a similar result for degree 6 equations. So the answer here is yes as well. So here is, here is my theorem, that if n is 3 to the k, or 3 to the k plus 3 to the l, where k is bigger than l, then the answer is uh, no. <laughs> this cannot be done. So note that this just barely misses 5 and 6. <laughs> Right, I mean, 6 is 3 plus 3, but I'm requiring... So here, when, when I, I had 2 instead of 3, I could combine the two cases. But here, I have to keep them separate. Right, so 6 is 3 plus 3, but I'm not allowing e equal powers of 3. So in particular, these classical theorems do not extend to polynomials of degree 9, 10, 12, 27, and so on. You can check that all of those are uh, of this form. This radical, uh, this extension, this reduction, can it, could it be done, these radicals, here are radicals? Um, yes. Yes. And I, I, th I think that this will become clear in maybe the next slide. So there, there are two ways to think about this, equivalent, of course. One is, again, in terms of these uh, equivariant rational maps. So, so here, I'm asking, I'm, I don't care what the dimension of x is anymore, but I, I mean, what the dimension of the image is, but I want this map to land in this in the subvariety of the projective space, uh, given given uh, by this uh, linear equation and cubic equation. That's what I'm asking. It's an equivalent question: Is there such a, a an SN equivariant rational map? And so the theorem on the previous slide that this is not possible again goes back to the fixed points. So the way I prove that it's impossible for those particular values of n is I find an abelian group inside Rsn and I find and I show that this abelian group doesn't have a fixed point in this in this uh, subvariety. So when n is a power of 3 I just take uh, a to be the integers mod 3 uh, and I embed it to the power m and I embed it into Sn by the regular action. And then the fixed points are precisely so I'm taking the regular representation of this group and I just decompose it as a, as a direct sum of one dimensional irreducible representations and the fixed points are exactly these, these one dimensional the fixed points in the projective space Pn minus 1 are exactly these one-dimensional uh, character spaces and then I just check that, that, that none of them satisfies this equation. And if n is of this type then the argument is similar but a little bit more complicated. I take, I take the uh, product of two such groups instead of pointing with my finger. So two groups of this, of this form, uh, one for m and one for k. And then I take the direct product, and I take the, um, and then I embed them into, into the symmetric groups, and then take the product of the symmetric groups and embed it into Sn. Um, and... <coughs> <coughs> You may ask why this doesn't work <coughs> when 
n is a sum of three, uh, of three powers of three, well, roughly speaking, because there are two equations. So if I have, if I have the sum of, so one of these representations is the trivial represent, one of these characters is the trivial character space. So for each one of the three, I'll have a, a, the trivial character space. So I'll have a three-dimensional space where the entire group acts trivially. So in particular, any, any, in this space, any element will be fixed by this, by this entire abelian group. And I only have two equations. So I will still have a curve inside there that will be fixed. So, so I will never get a contradiction this way with three. Okay, so, <coughs> so if, if n is not of this form, the situation is more delicate. Well, for one thing, we have two values of n where we know the answer is yes. Um, so, so here I really don't, don't know what to say, <laughs> what to do, except that I can relate it so I can prove it modulo a uh, long-standing open problem, open conjecture by uh, Castles and Swinnerton Dyer. So let me conclude by explaining how this relates to that conjecture. Um, so this is another way of looking at the problem. Um, we, are, we are interested in finding a Y such that the trace of Y and the trace of Y cubed are both zero. So let's look for y in this form with indeterminate coefficients. Um, <coughs> so these conditions, the trace of y and trace of y cubed is zero, can now be rewritten in terms of these coefficients. Um, so the trace of the trace of x, the, uh, x squared, x cubed, and so on, are known. They are by Newton's formulas, they can be rewritten as polynomials in these coefficients, in the elementary symmetric polynomials. So the condition that trace of y is zero becomes a linear equation in C naught, C1, Cn minus 1 with coefficients in my field big K. And similarly, the condition that trace of y cubed as zero becomes a cubic equation in those same variables. So, so this linear equation and this cubic equation give me a cubic hypersurface in the projective space Pn minus 2. And this cubic hypersurface is defined over my field big K. So what I'm asking is whether or not this cubic hypersurface has a K point. That's, that's what it boils down to. And if n is of this form, 3 to the m or the sum of two, 2 powers of 3, then the argument that I gave you before actually shows that this cubic hypersurface doesn't even have a zero cycle of degree 1 over k. So certainly doesn't have a k point. So that, that's totally hopeless. But if n is not of this form, then I can show that x actually has a a zero cycle of degree one over k. And so the situation is more delicate because in this case there's a long-standing conjecture of Castles and Swinnerton Dyer that asserts that if a cubic hypersurface has a zero cycle of degree one over k, then it has a rational point. So if one assumes this conjecture, then the converse to my theorem is also true. Um, Another remark is that if one replaces two by th three by two, then this conjecture, 
becomes a theorem.